our vineyard. Somos Viña. We are Vineyard. The thing that struck me the second week, the thing that really mm-hmm. struck me, the first week it was the reconciliation and just repentance. Mm. The second week, when more and more people started coming in, the seminary opened up two chapels, we opened up, and eventually the seminary opened up the gym too, mm. um, because so many people were, and then you've still got 2,000 people gathered on the university lawn watching the live stream. Wow. But that second week, it was the, the number of desperate people who were coming. Mm. We prayed with one woman who had come from Litchfield, Kentucky, which I think about a three and a half hour drive with her two sons. And her husband had some mysterious disease and couldn't walk. And she had brought a piece, she had clipped to cut a piece of his t-shirt off. Mm. And we stand there praying with her in the front of our building while she's gripping his t-shirt. Mm. And she is sobbing like a baby while we're praying for her. Mm. There was a WhatsApp group of all the people leading the simulcast site. And on Saturday morning, I, I it buzzes and I pick it up. And one of the texts from somebody at the university, like, we have a chronically ill woman here. She's dying, terminally ill. She can't get up the steps of Hughes. Can we get a prayer team out to her? And she'd take whatever, you know, the, whatever energy she could muster just to get there. Wow. You know, and um, it was it was such a, it was, it was a reminder, I think, of how, like, just how dry, spiritually dry the culture feels to people. Yeah, right. That your God is in this place, in this yeah. way, and desperate people come from everywhere. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's special episode, our host, Jay Pathak, meets with Jason Duncan and Caleb Maskell. Jason is the pastor of GCF Vineyard in Wilmore, Kentucky, and is an area leader. And Caleb Maskell is the Associate National Director for Theology and Education. We're going to talk about what's happening at Asbury and what it's like to pastor in that locally. Let's listen in. Well, uh, this is this is a first. We have two people joining me, Jason, Caleb. I'm excited to do this together. It's going to be amazing. Well, except Caleb, technically, <laughs> you have joined me other times, but it was without a microphone. People could hear you laughing in That's the background true. on more than one of these. I, I was would... like the live laugh track. That's right. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I've had people text me and say, "I can hear." Caleb back there, I think. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that was that was Caleb. That's right. Well, yeah. I was an invisible presence. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to be like, that is Caleb. It's true. Yeah. So 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 Jason, I we've generally done just tons of story that leads us to kind of understand some different components of different people's journeys with the vineyard or outside the vineyard. But we do it a little different given, you know, there's this thing that probably no one's heard of that's happening at Asbury, <laughs> <laughs> which which has a direct implication for you. But 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 let's take a bit of time to hear a bit of your story. So so tell me just a little bit about the beginning of you, the origin story of your superhero story, which is where were you born and grew up? Yeah, I was born in uh, West Virginia. Uh, just outside the coal fields. My family had history in coal mining and entre- well, entrepreneurship. My huh. granddad ran restaurants. I grew up United Methodist, and my dad uh, is now a retired United Methodist pastor. Huh. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the beginning for me. So I grew up in the church. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go into broadcast journalism. And I could hear it in your voice. Yeah, a- yeah. That required, that required, because I'm from West Virginia, learning how to read without there being two syllables where there should only be one. Right. Good. Um, so I like rehearsed that all through middle school. I bet. Yeah. And um, was going to go uh, study broadcast journalism at a local college, and God intervened that summer. And there were numerous things that happened. I was walking out. Actually, our pastor at the time had not been able to go and visit somebody whose husband had just died. Mm. And so I was called in the UM system. They call it a lay leader. Yeah. And so I was way too young to have that role. Which we just call a leader. A leader. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so I was way too young, but I got called to go visit her and had a great visit I mean, within the confines of what we were doing, had a great visit with her. And when I walked out on the front porch of her house, it was just such a beautiful sunny day. It was in June. And I just had this deep, deep sense of God saying, this is what I created you to do. Wow. And I knew like in that moment, I knew that if I proceeded with the broadcast journalism thing, I was going to be miserable. And mm. so I had had 
older ladies and gentlemen in the church, my home church, telling me for ages, you're going to be a preacher, you're going to be a preacher. We never call them pastors in West Virginia, you're always preacher. Right. My dad to this day is preacher Rick. And I called my dad. My dad had never pressured me about it. And I remember him saying, I figured this was going to come, but I knew if I pressured you into it, mm. It, it would, you know, it would be, a, it would be a bad deal for you if wow. I pushed you into it. God had to tell you to do this. So then I uh, went to finish college, studied Christian studies, and then went to Asbury. Hmm. So to seminary. Well, but, but to back up slightly, so your call to ministry wasn't preaching necessarily, even though you just moved to preaching. You were in like a pastoral ministry moment. You go yeah. to a visitation which tends to be the part of ministry people don't want to do. Right. If we're just being direct, they imagine themselves preaching and writing and doing cool stuff, but there's lights and, you know, stages and microphones, and your moment happens in a pastoral moment. Yeah, and I have to remember that because I really like preaching. (laughs) And so I, I have occasions when God brings me back to this is what the moment was. Hmm. And it was it was in this intense care situation, yeah. and God often has to bring me back to that because I could probably spend a lot more time writing sermons, sure, than I do because I really like that. But yeah, I, mean, I remember when I was growing up, the first pastor I remember before my dad went into the it was actually the pastor who led my dad to Christ, it was Richard Gibson, Reverend Gibson, and uh, he always wore seersucker suits, hmm. had his palmate <laughs> in his hair. So, uh, but he wasn't preacher. He was reverend. He was reverend. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Reverend right. Gibson. I'm, I'm picking up. I'm getting it. I'm yeah, slowly yeah. I'm acclimating. He came one time where there were a bunch of kids playing. Our parents had a young adult group and we were playing and we had they had taken us to the circus the day before. And we decided we would put on a circus. And when we went to ask our parents after we'd rehearsed this thing, if they would come in, they told us no. And we came back out into the hallway, and his office door, study door, was propped open a little bit, and the light was coming out. He was getting ready for Sunday evening sermon, because he you know, preached three times a week. And um, we went and knocked on his door, and he came down and watched this silly circus thing we had done. And mm-hmm. our parents ended up coming in because he was nearly rolling in the floor laughing at us. <laughs> um, and that shaped me, too. I mean, that mm-hmm. was it dovetailed with that other, this is pastors do this kind of work yeah. and take time with people and, and spend time. Yeah, spend time with people and what be with a, people. What a favorable story, because I know you probably grew up around PKs. Uh-huh. And My wife's one, too. Oh, so. see, yeah. there you go. So you, you have a compounding yeah. PK effect. And that isn't always positive, right? So lots of PKs are like, I cannot get far enough away from this madness. I mean, I remember when my dad first went into ministry in the little church he was in, pastoral ministry, the little mm-hmm. church he was in, there were a couple of ladies who really did not like him. Mm-hmm. And they were kind of... I, say this in the podcast, they were like quintessential old church ladies. (laughs) (laughs) They're coming for you. Yeah, yeah. I I can see them in my mind as soon as you say it, yeah. They came and sat down. I mean, they sat in the same seats for 50 years, but they came one Sunday to sit in front of my mom and my sister and I to complain about my dad uh, so so that we could hear it. And my mom doesn't take stuff like that, so she had words with them. But yeah, my dad always said, my sister and I are both, I mean, we both love Jesus. We've stuck it out in the church. My dad says, you always know that's an act of the Holy Spirit when a preacher's kid sticks with the church. Mm. Because you do get a lot of reasons in some context to to flee from it and run away from it. Yeah, that's right. Well, and the the good news, you know, I, I see this with my girls or a lot of different folks that I see grow up in the churches. You're, you're, I'm trying to think of the well, it's an abbreviation, so I think I'm allowed to say your BS meter. I, I'm trying to think of it. Your, <laughs> your authenticity meter? Is that a better way of saying it? Uh, it's pretty high, right? Mm-hmm. Like you can spot, this doesn't look quite right. Yeah. Or this person's trying to do something tricky. It's amazing how many kids that are raised in ministry can spot mm-hmm. authenticity, people that are playing a game, folks that are good at doing the little performance bit of it but aren't really living the life, especially if they've been in families where it it is favorable. Yeah. Their ability to smell what doesn't look right. Right. Well, and that serves you, if you're, if you go on to be a pastor, that serves you really well. Well, exactly. (laughs) I, well, and I think that's going to relate to what we're going to talk about in a minute, 
But but in one of your story, <laughs> you end up you end up then going to Asbury. I ended up going to Asbury. I was most pastors in the so the United Methodism was broken up into annual conferences, mm-hmm. and so we were in the West Virginia annual conference. And most pastors in my conference went to Duke Divinity School, hmm. and I had applied to Duke and had been accepted to Duke, and I got some promotional literature for a few things later and decided my dad was right because he kept saying, you, you really should go to Asbury. Hmm. You really should hmm. go to Asbury. And so got a few things that just concerned me a little bit. And so we were running off in June of that year to visit Asbury and apply hmm. um, and get in. So Wow. So that's kind of, that's your last moment. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. fascinating. Okay. So then you go to Asbury and what do you, what do you study? It sounds obviously got into it. So I have two thirds of an MDiv, but not any paper to prove it. Um, <laughs> I love this stuff. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I switched to the MA in counseling program and my advisor, she tried to convince me uh, to finish the MDiv program. But at that point in time, we had two kids mm-hmm. and I'm working a full-time job mm. and Kira's finishing up her degree. And it's like, it's just not in the cards to finish this, totally. to finish this thing. Sometimes I look back on it and wish I had, but not very often. Yeah. I bet. Well, and, and, and all I'm all I would ask now, if there's anyone at Asbury listening, is there any way you could send just two thirds of a diploma, to Jason? <laughs> that would. I I feel like that would be a great kind of summation. It would yeah. pull it all together. Just two thirds in a smaller than average envelope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we this, could even frame it at a t- you know the full frame, so you could see the third that's missing. <laughs> Yeah, ex- but, that would be great. But, <laughs> great. I'm even good if it just says Jason Dunk. Like, <laughs> Jason <laughs> Precisely. Jason <laughs> Dunk. for me. A thir- two thirds. You can see the third that's missing. It would be a talking piece forever on your wall. So I would, I've got to get that. That's someone someone like, could make that happen. The executive vice president goes to our church, so, so there I need you to go. see if he can work I feel this like, out. I feel like he should listen to this and make that happen. For oh, he, he better listen. I think it'd be so, important Jason for what it's Dunn. worth. To me, it's important. Dunn. That's all I want. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> well, and, and it wouldn't be an MD. It'd be like an MD. MD, That's which it. is better than MD. It is. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm well, I don't know. You, you I don't, don't want know. An, you don't That's want an MD true. with two-thirds Maybe of a diploma. Not. Maybe not. That's true. <laughs> That's true. It would be confusing. Okay. So you do your MA in counseling. You have two-thirds MDiv. Mm-hmm. So tell me how you – do you end, your next move is I'm going to plant a church or I'm, maybe a pastor? No, I'm, no, I was at the time – I was running a daycare slash preschool in a United Methodist church, which wow. was the job I was – working my way through school oh, doing. That's cool. And it was good for me because it was, even though it was in a church, it was the first extensive experience I'd had with, with nominal secular Christians. Sure. So it's valuable, valuable learning experience. I didn't like a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And so I, we, in, in the midst of that, I had graduated and really started feeling like you're, you're like God is saying, you need to get back in the church. I want yeah. to open doors for you to get into the church. And so we applied. GCF at the time had a co-children's pa- well children's pastor position open, and we knew the reference. She was a good friend of ours. And so we mm-hmm. applied for the co-pastor job in children's ministry and got that. And um, the church was trying to really, the format at the time, they were trying to do just part-time staff and an elder assigned to each person. And it, it hmm. revealed really quickly that it wasn't going to work out hmm. very, very well. But the first Sunday morning we started officially in children's ministry, I'm upstairs praying. I was laying on the bed kind of soaking in prayer. And it was this sudden thought, like I'm just sitting there with God. And I felt like hmm. felt like he spoke really directly and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you the lead pastor of this congregation. Wow. So I rushed downstairs to tell Kira what I sense he said, and, and we prayed, like, what do we do with this, God? And we felt like God said, keep your mouth shut hmm. and do your job. My dad called me later that day, and this is, this is kind of talk is outside the box for him. He calls me about 5 o'clock that day and says, I was praying for you this morning. I just really felt like God said, I'm going to make you the lead pastor wow. of that church. And he doesn't talk. That's kind of outside well, of his box. Well, because that's what I was going to ask you is out of your church background – to be laying in bed and thinking God spoke to you. Is that a common experience no, for you? No, no, no. And this was because I knew when, when I first came to seminary in 1998, mm-hmm. and you asked the question, where should you go to church in Wilmore? And GCF had been kind of an explosive thing in town because it was birthed mm-hmm. out of 
the Toronto blessing, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I asked, where, where do you go to church? And they were like, well, if you're a good United Methodist, you won't go to this church. <laughs> I'll tell you where not to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. This is true. Yeah. That's what I was told. So that's funny. When we, when we felt like God was moving in that direction, it was, it was the beginning of me and opening up to sort of more, more of the spirit, more, th- more charismatic things. So that was a, it was a huge deal for me. And then about May of the following year, after we had started, one of the elders called and she said, Jason, you know, things are just kind of, they're not working. They're, they're falling apart. And she said, you've done okay turning the preschool around. And we had kind of not through any brilliance of my own. It was like just God and all that, that we survived it and made it became something. Mm. She said, so you've got that. And she said, we just feel like we need somebody who's familiar with us. And then God is my witness, she said, and you and Kira are the only people who haven't gotten in an argument with anybody <laughs> over the last nine months because we had... It's a pretty high bar. It, well, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> not gifting, skill, yeah, no, no, call. No. It, was, it was you haven't gotten in a fight you know, with you anybody. You just haven't tussled yeah. so you're gonna exactly. be great okay but cool. we had really we had like stuck with when we felt like god said you keep your mouth shut and do right. your job and that's what we had we had done so a year to the day after we started as children's pastor i became the lead pastor wow fascinating so. and so you become the lead pastor and forgive my ignorance here but you said the church was birthed out of the toronto space was it a vineyard no, it, the, no. Um, it started in 95. Okay. I think the Randy Clark came to town in 2006 and mm-hmm. spent a week. And it was, it was a, at that time, it was a really divisive thing in the community because sure. Wilmore's a Wesleyan holiness community, mm-hmm. not a charismatic community, mm-hmm. right? And so it was super, super divisive. Um, but the church, the church had started, but then that Randy Clark coming to town kind of sent it all wow. in, a, in a whole new direction. And so... Mm-hmm. The first three years of uh, of the church, and it was it was sort of like Toronto stuff every Sunday night wow. going on. And so, just a funny story about that. They the first time they had people, uh, there were two co pastors. One did the morning, and he was the more evangelical leaning of the two. Mm-hmm. And then the other guy did the evening services, which were more significantly more Toronto style. Right. But one Sunday, the, the Sunday morning guy's gone, the Sunday evening guy subs, and there's like 10 people slain in the spirit. Wow. That morning. So it's the other like, guy. Hey, stay in your lane. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the other guy comes back and he's, he's like, what, what do I do with this? Like, this yeah, is outside of his do? box. Right. So he decides he's going to, you know, go and talk to these people individually. It's a good idea. Sure. And so he hears some of their stories and becomes convinced that, like, just real stuff was going on mm. in people. Then he puts some of them up to do an interview. The, you may want to cut edit this out, but he no, he, I won't. He, he puts some of them up to do the interview, and he didn't prep them ahead of time. And so he comes to one of them. It's a woman, and he says, "What was it like this experience you had last week?" And she says, "It was sort of like vomiting and having an orgasm all at the same time." <laughs> <laughs> this oh, well. is incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quite a line. And, and they say you'd look out on the congregation and people were like, well, I think I want that to happen to yeah. me, but not really. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> mm, there's a there's two things that should not go yeah. together. <laughs> yeah. That is a bumper sticker. T-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. Okay. So, so this church has this experience in Holy Spirit ministry things, mm-hmm. plus it's in this context where it isn't quite. Yeah, you know, yeah. working, and then the church isn't working for whatever reason, mm-hmm. and now you're the lead pastor. Mm-hmm. It's like, let's go. Yeah, is that like exciting, or is that like, wow? I guess um, I was excited for a month. <laughs> <laughs> there was a full thirty days yeah, that were yeah. just full yeah. of vision. Um, Got it. Yeah. Some of the, some of the things I don't want to like talk about publicly. I began right. to see some of the depth of problems that had been. Yeah. In the last few years, sure. if I had known about them when they hired me, I might well have said no. Well, and the Lord spoke to you, so yeah. that's a problem. Yeah, we yeah. set to work doing. We did a. <laughs> we did a. I mean, yeah, I mean, once he said, you know, you gonna "I'm going to do this," no? exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of work early on, to, um, and this is where the counseling degree helped me because I'd really sure. tended toward narrative counseling. And mm. it was this one evening when I'm just distraught and I'm asking God, "What do I do with this?" And I really felt like that that. God said, it's, the church has a bad narrative. There, there, are, there are individual narratives that are poor, but there are corporate narratives that are really, really poor. Wow. Yeah. And I couldn't put my hand on exactly what the narrative was. I think some of it had become nothing we do works mm. because they had been in a period of decline sure. for four or five years. And so it became thinking about how do we reverse 
that sort of corporate narrative. Yeah. And what do we replace it with? Yeah. Interesting. All that, and that means your training comes in handy. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, how how do you decide, or how does the church decide together? I think we're a vineyard church. How how does that happen? So um, back when I VLI. Um, Steve yeah. Siemens, who's a seminary retired, who's retired now, mm. theology prophet Asbury would go up. He was friends with Bert Wagoner mm. in some measure. And so Steve would go up and teach occasionally, I think, at VLI. Mm. And anyway, he had taught on this one occasion. And there had been a small vineyard in Wilmore that had come and gone through two or three iterations. Mm. And it had finally closed permanently. And Bert asked Steve, why is there not a vineyard church, a viable vineyard church in Wilmore? And Steve, I th- as, as I recall him, when he told me about it, said, without thinking about it, he said, because there is one, it just doesn't belong to you. Right. And so Steve came back, and he's been such a mentor to so many of us. And when he speaks into us, we listen really intently. Mm-hmm. And although he's totally unassuming and makes no, yeah. you know, doesn't use that to any of his own advantage, but he's like, I really think you guys need to think about this. And so mm-hmm. that began the process of adopting in. And oh, cool. we went to a, we went to a regional conference back in the old Great Lakes when it was the Great Lakes yeah. gigantic region. Yep. And Ranja and I, we had been sent on the mission, like go to go to the conference, yeah, see what scope it's like, it out, scope yeah. it out. We got in the car to come back, and I said, "What do you think?" And he said, "I, I think I'm vineyarded." And I was like, "Yeah, I think I am too." And I don't know what we'll do if the elders say we're not. Yeah, now what? Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And what year is that? They're around. It was 2011 to oh, 2012 in February. I think is when the adoption was completed. Okay, that's cool. So about a little over ten years yeah. ago. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And then if you just zoom all the way up, again, probably no one's noticed, but there's this thing happening in your town. (laughs) (laughs) And given some of the history of renewal Mm -hmm. being the sort of history of the church, plus your uh, UMC kids pastor getting words from God um, (laughs) that you're going to lead, you know, so there's some familiarity and what it would be like to hear from God, have experiences of the Holy Spirit, and now we're in this moment. So just briefly catch us up, like, what's happening in your town? How has your church been around that? You know, just in case someone's been living in a cave or under a rock (laughs) and hasn't seen something. (laughs) So on, I think it was Wednesday, February 8th, we were getting ready to have staff meeting at 3.30, And we got a text from a member of our church who works at the university. Mm -hmm. And her text said, I think revival is happening. There are several hundred students who've collected in Hughes Auditorium. Mm -hmm. And Hughes is, if you go into Hughes on the average day, you may not, you may not necessarily sense it, but it's, it's a genuinely thin spot. Mm. It's a genuine thin space Mm. in Wilmore. You say more about a thin space. What's that um, mean? Well, it, it's just it seems to, it, one of these places. I think it was the Celts who came who talked about it yeah. initially, right? It's one of these places that that sometimes when God shows up in that place, there's very little barrier, right? You know, and so because there've been, I think the university website count, counts eight. This one, would, last one, would have been the ninth. So mm. there've been eighth sort of revival. And, and count all starting in Hughes Auditorium, <laughs> and um, well, not the first two because Hughes wasn't built. But so there's the history of that in the school. So mm-hmm. we did a quick staff meeting because some of our folks wanted to get over there right away. Sure. I had to go home and take care of some stuff. When we go back, there's still hundreds of students mm. in there. The worship was all acoustic, sometimes really bad, <laughs> and uh, but it, people were. It was just worshiping, and the the, the environment was. I, I had never experienced anything quite like it in my life. When you mm. walked in within just a few minutes, especially in those first three or four days, I don't cry a lot, but I would get tears in my eyes and smile all at the same time. Mm. But also, so you, you had that sense, but also it was as if the, the presence of God in the place would just lay your heart bare too. Wow. So you couldn't hold on to things that, you know, and I, I had a, a reconciliation experience that very evening mm. you know, with somebody I hadn't spoken to since May of 2020. And that was one of the themes of the first three or four days. It's just all of these reconciliation stories. People would walk in and see somebody they hadn't seen for 10 years mm. and just immediately know they had to deal wow. with, with whatever this stuff was. Somebody told me one night, late in the night, they went out on the front porch of Hughes, which has got like the, the, with the steps from Rocky mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. leading up to the door. And uh, they said there were like 25 people outside texting, crying and texting apologizing wow. to people mm. for things they had done. And so 
it kind of grew. Uh, the first three days were really precious and sweet. And it's just continual worship. Continual worship 24-7. Wow. And so the crowds would get high in the evening. Then usually around 1 a.m. it would filter off, but they kept worship going. Sometimes by 5 a.m. in the morning, there's only 20 or 30 people in there, mm-hmm. but they just they just kept rolling with it. Wow. Yeah, I, I like I said, I'd never experienced anything quite like that. Where where I mean, I've experienced intense moments, but not yeah. anything where I had all of these different kinds of emotions going on at yeah. the same time. And it was all just when I look back on it, I'm like it was just the presence of God felt that thick. Right. You know. And there's this fruit of repentance and reconciliation. Right. And, and so this is going day and night. Right. People milling around. People flying in. Yeah. yeah. It that it started to get wild on the first Saturday. Hmm. And I remember going over that afternoon. I'd had to run some errands for something that morning. And I went in for a little bit that afternoon because we worship on Saturday. We're the Seventh-day Adventist Vineyard. Um, <laughs> so we, 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 we worship on Saturday. Right. But I got to go over for about an hour. And that was the first time you couldn't find a seat. Hmm. In, in it was just there was not one left anywhere and by Monday people were coming from everywhere right. I mean this thing started with 19 students staying after chapel to pray wow. and continue to repent and by the Sunday a week and a half later there are 20,000 people in a town of 5,000 in one day wow. and over the course of the time they estimate maybe 50,000 people came through so that's pretty wild yeah it was it was absolutely and it's like Worship, continual prayer, people repenting, crying, testimonies. Yeah. Yeah. So testimonies all just sort of flowing. The, the, fir- the first bit, they would allow anybody who wanted to share a testimony after they had kind of been filtered through to share a testimony. Toward the, toward the last few days, they started restricting it to university students. Sure. Which, because that's their constituency and that's, you know, that's a Gen Z is, their, is where their focus needs to yeah. be. But yeah, testimonies were that was some of the, that was everybody's favorite time of the day because they did mm. testimonies in every afternoon during the minister. They called it the ministry program. So there was a ministry program in the morning, then one from two to five, then one from seven to whenever, mm. and worship continuing all the way through that. Mm. The testimonies were some of everybody's favorites. Yeah, because you'd end up with anywhere from ten to twenty-five students sharing what God had been doing. Mm. Yeah, which is like repentance reconciliation repentance and reconciliation the thing that struck me jay the sec the second week the thing that really mm-hmm. struck me the first week it was the reconciliation and just repentance mm. the second week when more and more people started coming in and we opened up as a simulcast site because mm-hmm. there was just there was no space wow. left the seminary opened up two chapels we opened up and eventually the seminary opened up the gym too Hmm. Um, because so many people were, and then you've still got 2,000 people gathered on the university lawn watching the live stream. Wow. But that second week, it was the, the number of desperate people who were coming. Hmm. And uh, I, so we, we prayed with one, uh, one woman who had come from Litchfield, Kentucky, which I think about a three and a half hour drive with her two sons. And her husband had some mysterious disease and couldn't walk. And she had brought a piece, she had clipped to cut a piece of his t shirt off. Mm. And we stand there praying with her in the front of our building while she's gripping his T-shirt. Mm. And she is sobbing like a baby while we're praying for her. Wow. And I got uh, – there was a WhatsApp group of all the people leading the simulcast site. And on Saturday morning, I, I it buzzes and I pick it up. And one of the texts from somebody at the university is like, we have a chronically ill woman here. She's dying, terminally ill. She mm. can't get up the steps of Hughes. Can we get a prayer team out to her? Wow. And she'd take whatever, you know, the, whatever energy she could muster just to get there. Wow. You know, and um, it was, it was such a, it was, it was a reminder, I think of how, like, just how dry, spiritually dry the culture feels to people. Yeah, right. You know, that, that you hear God is in this place, in this yeah. way, and desperate people come from everywhere. summer, Vineyard USA is hosting our national conference, Making All Things New, at Ridgecrest Conference Center just outside of Asheville, North Carolina, from Monday, July 31st to Thursday, August 3rd. We're creating an experience that will be great for the entire family, adults, teenagers, and kids, as we focus on evangelism, church planting, and global missions. Registration opens to the public on February 8th with early bird pricing, so make sure to check out vineyardusa.org to learn more and register today. See you on the mountain!
Caleb, you're listening to this. You're our church historian. You study revivals. You've done all kinds of American history. I mean, when you hear these stories and you square them against stuff you know of, mm-hmm. like how, how do these things square up? Like when you hear about like, is it like, oh, yeah, that's the exact same kind of thing. Here's what seems different. Here's what. And you were there. You showed up. I too. did. Yeah. I, I had the pleasure of getting to go and, and, and spend an evening uh, with Jason and mm-hmm. Ronjo and some of the other folks at the outpouring. I mean, the thing that I noticed when I was there was all that all that you guys have been naming the repentance. But there was a kind of gentle repentance that seemed to be emerging out of an experience of the love of God right. that was coming through the worship. Hmm. In certain ways, it felt very familiar hmm. to me, I would say. The, I mean, not, not to make it anything less than it was, but it sort of felt like a 1,300-person vineyard home group. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's kind of sweet and connected. It was sweet and connected, and, yeah. lots of singing, very yeah, straightforward. Yeah. The simplicity thing that a lot of people have mentioned was very right. present to me as well. Hmm. I mean, it was simpler than our little local church in terms of the way worship functions, right. and that felt really good. Hmm. Adam Russell director of vineyard worship has called it not low production but no production (laughs) which i imagine some of the folks responsible for shepherding the thing might take a little exception to there's some production but it was it it was very gentle and humble Hmm. and it felt to me like it reflected the fruit of the spirit Hmm. I mean, I had a similar experience to you, Jason, when I walked through the door on whatever day it was, 10th or 11th day or something it was going, and it just brings tears to my eyes. I'm smiling and crying, you know, because it's so beautiful. Well, and then, but then also knowing your personal story, you've been, you were in Toronto as an intern in the I height was. of the renewal. I yep. mean, yeah. I mean, my faith has been deeply, deeply formed by experiences of renewal yeah. that, felt uh, very consonant with what's happening at Asbury. Right. Um, you know, I spent a year in Toronto and, and, and had some encounters with the Lord in, this, in the renewal, not in Toronto, but in that renewal era that yeah, were very yeah, yeah. similar. And, and I honestly, I mean, that's how I began to know what the vineyard was. Right. Right. So I don't, uh, there's a continuity is what I'm trying to say yeah. uh, with what I experienced there. And the spirit, I mean, the spirit was so beautifully at work. If I'm looking at sort of historical revivals in context, I mean, the first thing I would want to say is that, you know, people sort of can sometimes get hung up on terminology, right? Is it a revival? Is it an awakening or an outpouring? And generally speaking, I think that the folks folks who, who want to get clear on that are trying to do so because they want to speak with humility and thoughtfulness about what the Lord's doing in the world. Sure. So, like, I'm fine for that conversation. And, and they're resistant to maybe some of the hyped, hyper-focus, well, yes. over-realized 100%, whatever. Right? 100%. And because there is a phenomenon mm-hmm. in it, American evangelicalism initially, and then sort of a, a frame framework that became global around sort of evangelical Christians that you can just schedule a revival, right? right? A revival is going to happen Monday to Friday in July, and we're all going to put up a tent and do a thing. And, right. you know, Charles Finney in the 19th century very famously said, revival is a work of man, by which he meant that mm. it's the duty of every Christian to be revived and to do have a kind of piety that reflects their salvation. Hmm. And, you know, I I don't prefer that way of thinking about it personally. Uh, You can see why Finney and his ilk said what they said. I'm not trying to demonize them. but But I would say that in my experience and also in my study of the history of the church, revival or awakening, whatever's happening at Asbury, what we saw in Toronto, that's not a phenomenon that's restricted to North American or, or Anglophone, you know, evangelical right. 18th, 19th century. That's something that the church has been experiencing since Pentecost. Yeah. And of course, different times and places reflect different sort of cultural values. But what I saw at Asbury reflected something that felt very continuous with all kinds of stories of the way that the spirit moves hmm. in different settings. 
And I think the way you can tell that is both by, you know, some of the kind of outward phenomena, right? The singing and the praying and the repenting and the, and, and the way people were relating and, mm-hmm. and, and that sense of the palpable presence of God, which yeah. God in his mercy just seems to choose to do, whether we like it or not, that's just how it is. Right. But also the fruit of the spirit, mm-hmm. right? When you hear the stories of what's happening at Asbury, it's gentleness, it's kindness, it's people being patient with one another. Yes. And, and there, I mean, there's endless stories coming out of there now about, you know, people at the gas station getting interviewed and saying, why are these visitors being so kind to us? And that right. kind of thing. So from my perspective, what I saw felt like the way that the spirit has renewed the church over right. and over. Right. Yeah. There's a kindness, a gentleness. I mean, I think for many who are sort of in these more charismatic oriented environments, the knee jerk reaction to celebrity culture is well founded so yeah. you know it's normal is to look at something like this and be like well who's who's running it who's leading the meetings right which really cool worship leader is leading worship and how could we even get recordings to be able to capitalize on some magical moment and what has been the consistent witness at least of this moment is people going uh you could watch the videos and what you'll experience is something different than the sort of production of what you watch. Yes. And there's no phenomenal moment with the special leader on the stage shouting the cool sets of things. Well, the, I mean, the beauty of this moment with respect to celebrity that I saw is not only were there no celebrity leaders, but mm. there weren't even celebrities wandering around talking about how this wasn't a celebrity phenomenon. Right, right, right. Right. There was no virtue signaling. It was yeah. just people worshiping the Lord. And yeah. there was a kind of, yeah, a kind of purity in mm. a way to it that just felt lovely. So, so Jason, like I'm trying to think... I've thought about this quite a bit, actually, over the last few weeks. If I'm pastoring a church where this thing is happening near me or in our church, what should I do? Like, you know, because what I don't hear you saying is, man, our church have been fasting and praying for 20 straight days. And then on the 21st day, the Lord did this thing. And we were like, yes, this is what we have been quote unquote contending for whatever whatever language there is because you hear all this kind of language around this stuff there's like a there's like a whole lexicon that follows this kind of phenomenon so i don't hear that but yet you're the kind of church that's going yeah we're familiar with this and we we like this that, that we we don't have to go through six steps to believe this is god or how we interact with this so how, how did you begin to think as a pastor? You're thinking about your church. You're thinking about the people that are there. That there's a lot to do there pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, we were we were taking a lot of steps without thinking. Sure. Be, I, I, at one point, I remember saying to some of the folks at the university, I was like, "You guys are like you're chasing after the Holy Spirit, and He's just moving faster than you can move." Right. And they were giving it all they had. And so a part a part of it for us initially was how do we support them. Yeah. Right. How do we support Dr. Brown and Sarah, who's the vice president for student life, and Greg, mm-hmm. the, the chaplain, and 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 some of that? So, a lot of it was not coming in, trying to, which they would have rejected anyway, rightfully so, trying to take it over, use it opportunistically. But it's okay. We're going to be in a servant role here, yeah. not not in a leader role at all. So yeah. we're going to be the people at the at the the altar rail, the kneeling rail, praying. We're going to be the, you mm. know, we'll we'll do all the background work to open up a simulcast site just to kind of be in in support of it to be helpful. Yeah, right. to to uh, yeah, just to be helpful. I mean, and so it was really for us. It was a, it was a, it was just a servant role, you know, mm. and. You know, some people think about these things opportunistically, and they're looking about how to take advantage of it. Sure. And and so, of course, you want to see more university students in the life of the church. But you know, the the crucial issue at this point, I think we were t- talking about this in a phone call last week. It's how do we help the university with discipleship? Yeah. In the in the wake of this, and what does it mean? 
not to be opportunistic, not to fill the pews necessarily. Right. But how do we how do we disciple this? How do we help the Gen Z students who just went through this grow with this? And experience. One of the cool things that happened is we ended up being the go-to for any kind of spiritual manifestation nobody else knew quite what to do with. <laughs> hey, those are what venue people do. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, and I, I got, I got sure. one one night. I got a text. It was unfortunately after I got home. Can you come and help us with this particular thing? You are mm. some vineyard people. Totally. Can you send some vineyard people over? I to, love that to help with this, which is is a huge thing in our community, given the rift yeah. when the church started in '95. That that. These that you would have a a charismatic leaning congregation and they would have a place at the table. Well, and I, and I would wonder that like how many of the other churches see this in the way you see it, right? So there's any number of pastors in town. There's got to be a chunk of them that are like, this is just weird. Yeah, I I I don't know. Um, Maybe they're not vocal. Yeah, they're not vocal. The the one thing that stood out to me the first two or three nights, and this is not to say that other pastors were not there because I wasn't. Taking yeah, you're stock. Not, I'm just remembering what I observed. Not taking attendance, right? Yeah. I, my whole staff was there at some point in the first two days, sure. serving and doing ministry. And the Anglican staff the, of the Anglican Church in mm-hmm. Wilmore were there, and it was. Um, and it reminded me kind of the the places where Anglicanism and the Vineyard meet. Yep. You know, yeah. Yeah. A lot around, of those places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there were some that just were like, "Nah, I don't know what this is quite yet," which is fine. Again, like everybody's got their own job. They're they're not. It's not like everyone's waiting around for something to do. No, <laughs> no, no. Everybody had stuff to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. I mean, it was we we finally had to we finally toward the end had to say no. We cannot simulcast for a few days because we have like yeah. we have people that yeah. have to be cared for that we haven't been able to yeah. care for Precisely. for the last. Yes. You know, one of the other things that that we ended up having to do the week before last is not everybody had a wonderful experience. Hmm. You know, and so there was there was pastoral care to do on the backside of that as well. So yeah. what happens if three fourths of the congregation went to use auditorium and had this incredible experience right. and you're a part of the one fourth that came in and left with a question mark. Yeah. You know. I mean, if I could make an observation about yeah. that, I think one of the realities when the Lord moves is that God is moving and people are responding and sort of reacting in certain ways to that move. Yeah. So I, I heard Dan Wilt say something lovely, which is the outpouring at Asbury is a reflection of something God's doing in the world. Hmm. And now the question is, well, how are we responding? And there are responses in the moment, like I had a good experience or a bad experience or an ambivalent experience, which is morally neutral, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you had whatever experience you had. Maybe somebody prayed for you in a negative way and you need to pastor that and so on. So, So there's the short term, but then there's the longer term, which is how do we think about our discipleship in yes. relationship to this move of the Holy Spirit? Uh, you know, and uh, what I observed, at least out of my time in Toronto, which was so formative for me and also so many others. I mean, like you, Jay, and your mm-hmm. church, Jason. And I mean, there's so many other leaders in the vineyard who are many of whom are in their 40s right now because we were in our late teens or early 20s when that was all going down. The difference between going to a renewal meeting and having a powerful experience and going to a renewal meeting, having a powerful experience and then becoming a formed leader really, I think, has to do with the both pastoral care and equipping coming out of those moments. Yes. So it was in those contexts that I came across people like Steve Nicholson Steve and Cindy, who were teaching everyone who is moving in those spirit-filled environments, look for where the spirit's working and bless it. Here's how you might pray in a non-invasive but encouraging way. Here are the ways you can discern mm-hmm. using scripture. What What is the spirit saying or doing in these moments? And because the power has increased based on God's sovereign choice, mm-hmm. There's a way that you can get much quicker feedback and you can learn a lot more in those kind of environments. Yeah. So one of my hopes for this moment, and Jason, you can tell us if this is what you're experiencing or not, but one of my hopes and prayers even for my community in this moment is that if the Lord moves in similar ways wherever I am, that we can pastor people through it into a place of formation That's good. where life in the spirit and life in the word are like two tracks of a train. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Spirit and word. Yep. Always, always together. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
say more about that because like I'm trying to think you're in a town you said of 5,000 50,000 people appear mm-hmm. that's not all great <laughs> I mean no. I'm sure like <laughs> yeah. no I mean and there's like a series of things there that are difficult to process one being do we all have to show up a special place when things happen mm-hmm. and then what's the impact on the humans that are just doing their everyday work mm-hmm. there mm-hmm. that's not all positive it's not, and people as they started to try to wrap things up you know, god bless kevin brown who's the president of the university i mean to have to make the hard decision that university life has to go back to university yeah, we, life we're still a thing here we have right. things to do right, right. we've got yeah. 1200 students we can't host 50,000 people right 50, continually more people right, right. And so he, of course, got all the criticism you're quenching what the spirit is doing and, yeah. and whatnot. And, but I think what people don't realize is that there's behind the scenes work going on. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we assign students? And I know they're working on this, like sending students here to share what has happened to them, you know, and it's sort of taking taking that out. Mm. It was it was the last Sunday we we went into the last Sunday of public services. We went into Lexington, which is about 20 minutes away. To, we just need to be out of town for a little bit. <laughs> and uh, we, I get a text on that WhatsApp group that they have, that the state police are now checking residency to get into Wilmore. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because you can't get in. I learned later that I, as I understood it, the reason for that was that at some point on Sunday afternoon, the city sewer system overwhelmed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Revival is bad yeah. for you. Revival is breaking yeah. your city. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it was, it was yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, and, no, that, but, it, but that makes but the sense. Infrastructure, and it was, it's in, there are some practical realities. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And the people who were upset about it, I mean, you, you know, you remember that like, okay, we still had students who had to go to school, right? Yeah. The grocery store still had to open. Oh the, yeah. There's the, restaurants. Yeah. There's they still gas have stations. to do their stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure there's any number of like not pumped about it. Like maybe there are Christians that are like, this thing's weird or they don't really have any faith. I, I mean, I imagine just being in the city without faith, and I, like, run a coffee shop or something. Yeah. Like, that's got to be weird. Yeah, it, it, probably outside of Wilmore, yes. But there it's like, yeah, this is there, what we do. There it's, I mean, what, it's, it's, such a, it's such a unique little community. Right. Uh, um, because I often thought, at one point in time, I was just, just pondering, right? And I'm like, maybe God does this here every 15 to 20 years, something not this long. Nothing had ever gone on for this long continuously. Mm. But maybe this happens every 15 to 20 years because if it does do this, like this is a whole little community. Hmm. by and large, that will just lay out the red carpet to serve. That's and it's cool. a privilege to live in a place like that. That is cool. You know, where everybody, even at the end, when people were starting to fray, everybody was still nice, hmm. you know, and the struggling to, to grow fruits of the Spirit, maybe. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're more oriented toward it, is what yeah. you mean. Yeah. yeah. And what do you f- feel like, so now you're sort of wherever it is, and I don't know how he just said it. He kind of wound it down. We're back to school life. What are, what are you hoping as a local pastor is the like ongoing fruit? What are you going, man, I, I really hope for students, for the life of our church. Obviously, there's a generational moment here, Gen Z. I mean, what, what, how, are, how are you thinking about that we can join with you prayer, with you in prayer? I, I think I was having a conversation with this. It was the seminary's vice president of community formation, I think is his title. And and we were thinking, and I've been praying this, is is I was so moved by the desperate people who came. Hmm. And I have been really, really wrestling with why is that not, why, why do people not feel that way about local churches? And why are they not running to us when they're that desperate? And I don't have any great answers question, for that, yeah. but it's I have found myself over the last week to a week and a half, really just saying, Jesus, I just like desperate people. Send the desperate people. I've had a couple things happen since then that made me want to take that back. But. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> do, you, do you know what you're yeah. praying here? Yeah, yeah, but I get it. It's yeah. good. Yeah. Um, it's really good. I think good. it's a but, good prayer. Yeah, and I think that's been the thing. If I were going to say one lesson for our congregation as I've been reflecting, and I didn't give any lessons immediately after it was over because it was like, I need a little bit of time to pray of through course. this and reflect on all of this. But I think that's like I, I want us to grow into being a, a, a faith family, a community, hmm. like where desperate people know if we go there, they're gonna they're gonna help us into hmm. the presence of God. 
right? And and they believe that some important stuff can happen to it's me. It's beautiful in the in the presence of God. And so I think for the long term, that's I mean that's a big deal for us as a congregation. Is is what does it mean to be a place where desperate people will come running? Well, and and I mean, and Caleb, you could speak to this more clearly than I could, but there is mixed reports on the long term fruit of outpourings of this kind of nature, right? Like, like if you just yeah. look at the historical record, even guys like Edwards at some point in there is going, I don't know what this is. I mean, yeah. like pe- people, people have, we, though we all love these kinds of stories, yeah. there seems to be ways that we're to learn things and or grow out of these. Well, I mean, to, so to my mind, the moment when the spirit comes, whether it's in a, you know, an 18th or a 19th or a 20th century thing mm-hmm. that we now call a revival or yeah. in the emergence of a monastic order like the Franciscans or the right. Dominicans or the Celtic spirituality with the evangelists. I mean, the spirit just moves, right? Yeah. I mean, we haven't even talked about like the churches in China or the Middle East, totally. their histories of things like this. Yeah. So uh, Korea. I mean, there's a lot of different examples where I'd the spirit say. comes. Yep. And it seems to me as from my, you know, limited vantage point, the, when the spirit comes, it's like it heats up the metal hmm. and that enables people to be formed in a day or a week or in two weeks, what, which that would otherwise take a, a longer period of time. Yeah. But then the question is, out of that possible formation, who are the people who are saying, yes, Lord, send me, and also saying, I want to be taught, going to their elders, going to their pastors and leaders, saying, I've had this experience, and it's like a 90-degree turn in my life. So what can I do, either in the habits of my own heart or in the life of my community, not to stay all heated up, not because, because you know, that's like the transfiguration mentality, right? Mm-hmm. Where we're just going to, Peter says, we're going to stay up on this mountain forever. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus is like, you have no idea what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so not to stay in that place, but to become the kind of person that the Lord is trying to make in, yeah. in those environments so that the habits of the heart lead to deeper future transformation. It's good. So like I think of, you know, an example, there, a very famous uh, African-American woman named Jarena Lee in the 19th century who was profoundly formed by uh, Methodist revivalism. And she was someone who became an important woman preacher. And the habit of the heart that she cultivated through those experiences was the ability uh, to listen to the spirit Mm -hmm. and to have confidence that the Lord was speaking to her, even when others were saying, "Mm, you know, you're a woman, you can't say those things, Mm -hmm. right? So there was a kind of bravery and courage, or Harriet Tubman would be another amazing example on the, you know, theme of... African American women in the 19th century, it, it became possible for people to live into habits of the heart formed yeah. by the Spirit in community mm. uh, because of the revivals of various sorts, whether they be the kind of Calvinistic Jonathan Edwards side of things or the more kind of Methodistic Francis Asbury side of things in the US. But no matter what the theology, that underwrote it, the experience of life with a living God enabled the possibility of, you know, freedom and courage Mm -hmm. and honesty uh, for many, many, many people, which led to enormous knock-on effects, enormous fruit. So I don't think we really get to judge the fruit of a revival um, in the short term, because it's actually, I don't think God does revive. Get, whatever happened in Asbury is not about the, that two or three weeks or right. whatever it was in Wilmore. It was about how do we see the formation of the people who were either there or yeah. connected to others like that, who develop a way of life that looks like the kingdom coming. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what is in my heart. And I think even historically, like speaking as a Christian and a historian, I think that that is one of the major discipleship effects yeah. of revivals, even in theological diversity. Yeah. Well, and I, what I'm struck by from my more distant vantage point, of course, is how it revealed how hungry people are. Mm, mm. You know, the amount of folks that were like, ah, here it is. This is happening. Who 
honestly, people that I wouldn't have thought would have a tendency toward that. You know, like there are sort of my more charismatic-y, revival-oriented type friends that are like, this is the thing we've been doing and praying for. But I was amazed at how many people maybe two or three clicks away from that were going, man, isn't this incredible? And then I think just the simple challenge to skeptics, you know, uh, of so you have a bunch of kids worshiping, praying, repenting, reconciling, calling out to God, which part of this don't you like? You know, like, like which, which thing yeah. are you like, you know, well, you know, it'd be better as if they just didn't do that. So even the, the more skeptical or cynical types had to at least say, I don't know what this is, but it, it's, it's a good thing. But to Caleb's point, the fruit, you know, will be shown over time. And so for you, you know, you're, you're talking to vineyard pastors and they're going, man, I would love to see something like this in my own city, in our church. What does this mean for our church? What's this mean for me and how I should be leading and thinking? Do you have anything to say to that? I mean, because it's kind of hard to know what to say when it's like, I don't know, something kind of just happened to me. Well, yeah, and I mean, that's I, I think that's the real challenge is I've been it's like trying to think about it. It's a hard question to answer right. because it's, it's like 19 students staying in chapel at Asbury University to pray is not an oddity. Right. Like that's that we, it was nothing. They've out done of, this before. They've done this. It was nothing out of the ordinary. And so I, I honor all of the people, including myself, who've prayed for revival, right? Right. But it feels so hard to it feels so hard to say that there was any human factor. Sure. Because it was just another typical chapel service, nineteen kids staying around, which is not out of the ordinary. Mm. And then it's like boom. Four hours later, there's 400 students and people flocking in from everywhere. And you, there's no explanation for it but God. Totally. You know, and I think, I do think prayer, I think prayer was huge. I mean, people have been praying for this since 19, the last one in 1970, right? Hmm. I think the other thing that's an important lesson to learn from the university administration is just receptivity, because there was no, they didn't rush to cancel classes, but they mm. didn't rush to end anything that was happening in Hughes Auditorium. And they were going to honor that. They sent a letter out to the professor saying, be patient with students. We've And, and there was just this incredible humbling receptivity mm. to what they were doing. I This may be my bias, having watched them do it. I just think not a, not allowing anybody to, to be become celebrity right. was an important part of the receptivity uh, to this. And so I don't know, I, I still don't have my mind wrapped fully around what that means in the life of the local church, except that I, it's got to mean praying. You know, we did, there was a lot of talking about travailing prayer out mm -hmm. of the Hebrides revival, which right. was talked about quite a bit, and, and the travailing prayer that goes into these things, and just the receptivity, mm. you know. I think it's, you mentioned Steve Nicholson earlier, and I think it's that same sort of mm. thing when he can sort of read the winds of the Spirit moving through the room. Right. And there was sort of this, this Wesleyan holiness way of doing that. Yeah. In, in, in this business, I think just being attentive mm. to those things mm. and not rushing. There was no rushing. When they saw what was happening, Kevin, Dr. Brown, said, we're going to let this go. Yeah, we're going to take our time with this. Yeah, and see, see what happens. Wow, that's so good. And like Caleb, for you, I mean, there's a percentage of humans listening to us that will be like, yeah, I know everything you're referring to. <laughs> 1970 Asbury, you know. Um, I think we've said Wesley, we said um, Finney, Hebrides, you know, we're using all these little words that people, people who have read all these things are going, yeah. And you're saying, oh, yeah, this thing in right. Korea and there's, you know, all these different, you know, things that have happened throughout history. If you're just a pastor, you're a leader listening right now and you're going, wait a minute. So there's these continual things. So the thing I read about in Pentecost Acts 2, the Holy Spirit's poured out, hmm. people speak in tongues, all these things happen, they preach sermons, blah, 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 blah. You're telling me that kind of thing, like of that magnitude, has happened through history. Yeah. That might be new information for people. So, well, I mean, 
<laughs> I, I have kind of a rule of thumb, which is any time that you think you're historically significant, mm -hmm. whatever beautiful <laughs> thing is already happening yeah. is going to get killed. It's getting messed with. Historical right. self-consciousness kills the spirit. Yes. So I would encourage people to pay no attention to anything that they believe is happening in their world that has some sort of like historical significance beyond right. themselves. Jesus was insistently against Gnosticism, right? People Amen. who hung around with Jesus said, you know, we're hungry. And he said, that's important. We should stop and feed the people. Right. Right. So there, there was all kinds of connection to the human body and re the reality of life yes. that I think honestly was one of the beautiful things about the way the Asbury administration responded. Uh, it was grounded. There, it was right. grounded. It was yep. humble. You know, I saw Craig Keener, this like world class New oh, Testament incredible. scholar who's in Jason's church, running around with a name tag on that said Usher. Right. He's just putting people in their seats. And I'm thinking, this is a work of the Spirit. This is a beautiful work of the Spirit. And I would also say that as valuable as prayer for revival is and desire and things like that, if you look at the history of revivalism, both in sort of evangelical Protestantism and beyond, I don't think there's any one factor that precedes revivals. There are different right. things at different times and God uses all of it, right? I think using a maxim that, you know, we are free and God is more free is a really helpful way <laughs> to yeah. think about how stuff happens in the world in relationship to our action. We're free to pray. We're free yeah. to worship. We're free to desire. And the Lord puts that in us, but God's freedom uh, creates beauty out of ashes in ways that we could never orchestrate. Uh, that having said all of that, right, that's almost really just by way of prologue to say that I am so encouraged by having been in Asbury. I'm so encouraged by seeing the responses to Asbury from folks who you'd expect to love it and folks who you would not yes. necessarily expect to love it. I think it reflects a spiritual hunger. Mm -hmm. And as pastors and leaders, we're called to set tables that introduce Jesus to people. Amen. And what that hunger and that desperation Jason was reflecting, what, what that does to me is it makes me say, you know, there are times when the Lord's going to show up in ways that are so much better than we could even imagine, even better than we could ask, as the scripture says. Amen. I just have faith for it in a renewed way in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that we're setting the table in my church when I'm leading worship, when I'm teaching or yeah. praying for somebody. I want to be like, Lord, you're at this table. And I, I think we could probably put in the show notes, but, you know, it's helpful for people to just have some historical sense of these things. Yeah. Like, at least for me, when I've read the stories yeah. from all over the world through time. It does increase my faith a little bit. I think yeah, to sure. myself, so what we're, what you mean, there's more than just kind of hoping people might show up to this class I'm going to teach or something <laughs> yeah, like that. Right. There's, <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, I'm just saying, like, there's a way that God can sovereignly move yes. that seems independent of my effort or striving, to your point. Yes. That really is a lot of our story in the vineyard is people that are like standing around seeking God, calling out to him. Yeah, I think our faithfully criteria serving. our criteria tends to be hunger. Yes. Where we were hungry and we were incapable, he met us. That's right. Yeah, yeah and that feels like doable. I feel like I can get hungry. I think so yeah. too. And I mean, look, it, I should probably produce some sort of reading list. Yeah, that's, I think that would help, honestly. That, just so people could remember. I mean, Thomas Kidd has a beautiful book called The Great Awakening, which mm -hmm. is an easy way into understanding The Great Awakening. Yeah. There's a great one on American Methodism by John Wigger called Taking Heaven by Storm, another mm. one uh, on the life of Francis Asbury for those who are interested in revivalism and leadership. Yeah. You know, even reading our own story for yes. vineyard pastors who haven't read The Quest for the Radical Middle, which is a wonderful first attempt at a history of the vineyard. And I think yeah. we're seeing more work being done to tell the stories there. Some folks might have seen the Jesus Revolution movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In those moments where there are sort of ineffable, surprising encounters, yeah. they're hard to capture in print or on film. 
even historians, I mean, even historians, there, there's no magic bullet for a historian to right. describe how these things work. But what we can say, just looking all but empirically at Christian history, is that this happens over and over again in all times and places. Read the life of St. Francis yes. by G.K. Chesterton. Read a, a little book called The Korean Pentecost. Uh, I mean... List is forming. Did you notice it just mm -hmm. formed for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all... But but again, I'm amazed at how many folks have either a really small view of these things, like, oh, well, we have a vineyard story with his Mother's Day, yeah. Lonnie Frisbee, or they don't have anything. Yeah. They're like, I don't know... I don't know if any of this happens, um, but it does stir us to pray. You know, I've, I've been praying for our vineyard pastors that some little spark might hit us where we just say, Lord, what about, what about us? What about this place? Mm -hmm. What about our church? What about our city? Yeah. And even just to begin to ask and imagine expands your heart, you know, your mind, your uh, what if we were a people that were this hungry for I mean, you? Yeah, if I had w just one one practical thing that everybody can try mm -hmm. would be to create an environment where we do something that is quite a distinctive vineyard practice, I'm discovering, it comes from our Quaker roots, mm. which would be that we worship and then we wait. Yeah. And we can wait with a kind of expectation that says, Lord, kind of like uh, the story of Samuel, right? Mm. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Yeah. And whatever happens next is whatever happens next. Yeah. But being in a posture of receptivity where we say, what I want above all is that I would know the presence of God and a life with Jesus. And I'm willing to look a little awkward. I'm willing to, you know, John Wimber's famous phrase, I'm a fool for Christ, whose fool are you? Yeah. To feel a little foolish yeah. in the interest of waiting for the Lord to lead. Amen. And then do it a few times and see what happens. Yep. My experience is that in those moments, the Lord moves. He tends to speak. He does, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he really does. Well, and, and to that end, small commercial we've been asking the vineyard to consider from easter to pentecost we're doing a series that we've put out for vineyard usa yes on different pieces of healing or listening to the voice of god and then some midweek or sunday night classes you can run to mm. kind of teach people to wait on the lord pray for the sick blah blah blah. but we're really hoping pentecost sunday mm. Mm. vineyard churches all over the country of the world will focus on Pentecost, of all things, on Pentecost Sunday, <laughs> and say together, come Holy Spirit, not just for their churches, but for the whole vineyard movement across the country and the world, because we need, we need the presence of the Holy Spirit afresh, yes. really every day, but all the more in our movement as a whole. And like this, this moment, um, you know, just inspires me. And I'm super grateful, JC, you made time to talk to us and process this a bit and and uh i'm i'm joining with you for prayer for the the fruit to continue in the life of your church and in your city and i guess uh, we'll have to check back in another 15 20 years <laughs> no i'm just kidding i'm just joking see how it goes and and, and this is this is neither here nor there but it, it is the thing i will remember right now I, I have a very visual like thinker when i hear things i see them in my mind and when I saw Keener with the Usher name tag in my mind, I thought immediately of Usher, the pop star. Like he was... <laughs> like he was... Greg Keener and Usher hand in hand. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> yeah. It was like in my mind. It all happened. <laughs> so that's going to be my lasting memory. My last thing is Jason Dunk. Jason, Jason Dunk. Dunk. Jason <laughs> Dunk, MD. That's right, MD. <laughs> Somebody make it happen. And, well. and send a picture when you get it. But God bless you. Thank you seriously for making you're time. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, really thank grateful. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah, I'm really man. grateful to you. So, so grateful. Yeah, because it'd be easy to just be like, I don't know what that is. Uh, I've got my... Uh, second part of my series on whatever this is or you know like um, no i mean people, what's the temptation people, yeah, yeah. I, I bet it is but thanks for being a part of it and really serving our whole movement um and we're for you and been really excited to hear all about thanks. it so can't thanks. wait to see how it all turns out 
The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org and we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.